and then you just schedule a pickup or drop off. How do you do this? Stamps.com. With Stamps.com, you get five cents off of every first class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail and up to 62% off UPS shipping rates. Super easy to do this, folks. You don't have to spend a minute of your holiday uh, season going out, going to the post office, going to UPS. doesn't matter. All you got to do is sign up for Stamps.com instead. There's no risk. And with my promo code Majority Report, you'll get a special offer. It includes a four-week trial plus free postage plus a digital scale. There's no long-term co- uh, commitments, no long-term contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Majority Report. At Stamps.com, enter Majority Report. Stamps.com, you'll never go to the post office again. And frankly, you know, Stamps.com saved my my buttocks when we were I was sending out DVDs back in the day. Yeah. And it was uh, made it so much, so much easier. Uh, check it out, folks. Stamps.com slash, uh, excuse me, Stamps.com, enter the coupon, the code majority report. Lastly, um, you remember that big hack of all the Twitter accounts? The big ones. I do. I do. All the blue checks were, yep. were X'd out for a little while. Um, these type of uh, hacks and attacks are happening more uh, frequently. They're more severe. It's not just Twitter. It's Facebook. It's eBay. It's Uber, whatever. All of these places have leaked data, such as passwords, credit card info, driver's license. That is just one of the reasons why I use ExpressVPN to safeguard my personal data online. Look, it is uh, there's a there's a million different ways that you can get um, hacked by by folks, and they will sell your personal information. They'll sell it on the web. Not good. Uh, ExpressVPN is essentially uh, it's an app. It runs concurrently with your other apps. It funnels your data through a, a sec- like a like the inner tubes, basically a, an encrypted tunnel, so that no matter what device you use, you can have peace of mind when you use the internet. Super easy. I know it sounds intimidating, but the app, I'm telling you, it's very easy. It just connects with one click. Boom, you do it. And it works up to five devices. And you can use the five devices simultaneously. So you can use it on your phone, your iPad, your computer, uh, your kid's phone, your kid's uh, computer. There's five right there. Uh, Protect yourself with ExpressVPN. It's the VPN rated number one by CNET, Wired, and countless others. If you visit expressvpn.com slash majority right now, you can arm yourself with an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash majority. Visit expressvpn.com slash majority to learn more. Okay, now joining us, the uh, professor of law from the Western New England Law School, Jennifer Taub, author of big dirty money professor you there we're still oh there she is hi can you hear us sorry am i unmuted now yes now we hear you uh (laughs) jennifer tab uh welcome to the show the book is uh big dirty money um thanks for joining us thanks for having me back sam uh so all right let's talk about um well Let's let's start with this. The term white collar crime. I mean, you make a point in the book of of talking about the um, I guess the predispositions maybe that are embedded in that term. And um, tell us about its its etymology, I guess, and its its development and how it how it uh, impacts what happens on a day to day basis in these in the pursuit of these crimes. I'd love to. So it turns out that the guy who coined the term white collar crime, his name was Edwin Sutherland, and he was a sociologist. And when he coined the term in 1939, it was actually a radical idea. And let me just pause for a moment, because today you hear a lot of people saying, and I agree with them, why do you call it white collar crime? These are just as bad as any other kinds of crimes, right? But his intention when he came up with that term was to capture and to critique all kinds of misconduct, some criminal and some otherwise unlawful, committed by people um, who were in the upper class, the upper echelon of society um, and corporations who were not actually being um, arrested, 
or convicted. So when he came up with the term white collar crime, obviously he's referring to white collars, which means the professional class as opposed to blue collars, the working class. And when he defined the term, he um, first he had the speech, radical speech he gave in Philly. And then 10 years later, he wrote a whole book critiquing corporate crime. And his definition of white collar crime was very status based. So it was crimes committed by people, men of high respectability and high status in the course of their occupation. So you see these two pieces together. He wanted it to be business related, but the first step is that it had to be the elite. Over time, sorry, Sam. Well, I was going to say, I mean, it's fascinating because we don't do that with, I mean, we don't even say blue collar crime, really. I mean, we don't, we don't point to the person's station in life to define the nature of their crime. I mean, right there, that almost gives away the whole game right from the get go. Because, I mean, I don't know if I'm a, um, if I, if I work in a corporation and I go, um, uh, mug somebody, is that a white collar crime? I mean, that, that, you know, uh, that, I, I, well, it's not. So but- that's interesting. He wouldn't call that a white collar crime. I would call that likely, um, is how they would be treated and under the rubric of implicit immunity of the upper class. Cause very often ordinary crimes, um, look at someone like Jeff Epstein. Why did he get away with it so long? Look right. at people from our, cl- I don't know what your class background was, but if it's probably similar to mine in kids who were drinking underage or smoking pot when it was illegal, and it still is in most places, you know, the police came and told them, keep the noise down. No one went to jail, right? So we already have that. But for Sutherland, he was specifically talking about financial kinds of crimes committed by the elite. So you're right. We don't do that. Well, see, in theory, we don't do that, right? We're just like, what is the, uh, from the French Revolution, the guy saying that rich and the poor are treated equally, either of them who steals a loaf of bread will go to jail, right? right. That's a similar thing we're ha- happening now. So over time, and I blame lawyers like myself, um, for completely, I mean, some of it might have been sociological, some of it might have been convenience. We lawyers um, think about crime and think about due process in ways that you have the government having elements they have to prove, right? If you're going to put someone in jail for burglary, the government has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt these elements of the crime. Similarly, um, with white collar crime, we started thinking of it as crime as opposed to criminals. And his first speech was a white collar criminal. His book was entitled White Collar Crime, which took a corporate focus, right? So he was initially focused on the people. So he, what, what happened though is the reason why I think his definition went astray in the direction I'm going to talk about is he actually tragically died right after his book came out. So he goes, gives a speech in 39, spends another decade researching corporate criminality, publishes a book, which was censored by his publisher. They had to excise, redact the names of all the corporations he mentioned and used like code names and they made him take out a chapter. So this is familiar. Then this, this is published. It's reviewed well. And he dies a few months later of a heart attack on his way to Indiana university and his, his disciples and others picked up the cause. But when you get sociologists or criminologists and and lawyers and academics um, where we have all gone, including the FBI is a um, conduct based definition. So when we talk about white collar crime now, or at least when I teach it, because I have a case book on it, we have a list of usually federal criminal offenses. So not surprisingly, things like, um, you know, the false statements statute actually is considered a white collar criminal statute or obstruction or even RICO or um, things like tax fraud um, and um, conspiracy. Right. These sound like very generic offenses, but these are the tools in the toolkit that are used um, for white collar criminal offenses. In my case, but we also have um, environmental harms um, and we also have money laundering. But just to be clear, um, just to be clear, it's, um, you know, oh, sorry, let me say one thing. The most important offenses, which I shouldn't skip, are the fraud offenses. So at the federal level, we use um, mail fraud and wire fraud. As it, and people may wonder, like, why is it called mail fraud and wire fraud? This is just to get a federal, you know, with federalism, to get a federal jurisdictional hook. Fraud is, a, is basically intentionally um, providing someone with, intentionally misleading somebody um, in order to get them to depart with, to part with something um, of value to them. And to make it a federal offense, you either need the mail involved or, um, you know, wires, meaning the telephone or the Internet right. involved. That's all those things mean. 
Okay, so wait a second. So w- when we say like these things are considered white collar crimes, like wh- like where under uh, under what auspices? In other words, like is are there statutes? Is there are there are, are is it? Is white collar crime a designation that is simply used by convenience for law agencies to say like, oh, this is the way that we're going to organize, the, you know, our our police department or our, you know, our police agency? Or are there are there some type of statutory implications to these crimes because they are considered white collar crimes as opposed to like, are they are they privileged in some manner? No, I mean, it's, so this is what's so interesting, right? Imagine there's a guy who literally coins a term that's now used worldwide and no one has a definition. So let me say how it actually works. Um, the, what he was, what he was, one of the things he was railing against is the fact the FBI, and they still do cr- create, collect nationwide crime statistics. So you'll sometimes hear about burglary or rape or theft on the rise. And the FBI now does a really good job. Thousands of reporting agencies from local, state, tribes, um, colleges, and the federal level report these crimes. But there is not, when the FBI statistics, there's not a classification called white collar crime. And they've written, um, you know, over a decade ago, there was sort of a report written about what are the kinds of crimes we might consider to fall under that. And what's tricky um, is the, the, although the system's evolving under the old reporting system, they would count things like embezzlement, any kind of fraud, because states have different definitions, right? Embezzlement, any kind of fraud, um, and even things like um, welfare fraud, they might throw into that bucket. Um, you know, so it's it's very, uh, at, the, at the sort of FBI level that does the nationwide statistics, it's not really defined. When you get to the federal level, what's really interesting um, The Department of Justice has prosecution guidelines, and they actually think about status. So there's a whole prosecution manual now that was started under Eric Holder back when he was a deputy AG, right, about prosecuting corporations and other business entities. And that's changed um, from the 90s um, up through um, the changes both Sally Yates and even um, recently um, Rod Rosenstein made in 2020. So we have guidelines for prosecuting corporate entities, but you don't really... Um, you know, there's not really something that the um, the DOJ specifically has on white collar crime with one caveat. Every year, the Department of Justice, you know, there are 94 of these AGs. Right. They um, report their um, all the cases that they have either declined or brought. And they do on their annual report have a section of different types of crimes that they put under white collar but the things they put under white collar are not um, the same things they put like a decade ago. They keep moving around the things I might put under that. And we should right? say, so I, I put bribery of public officials under white collar, but some people might put that under public corruption. They don't put money laundering under white collar anymore. They put it somewhere else. So like, it's very hard to compare apples to oranges to try to figure out this, even as we've moved to a conduct based definition. Sorry for that long explanation. Okay. It's a bit of a mess. So when you say 94 AGs, you're talking U.S. attorneys. In, yes, in, I'm sorry, not AGs. I meant U.S. attorneys' offices. Right. Okay. Sorry, U.S. attorneys' offices around the around the country. So, for instance, in New York, there's there's uh, you got the eastern, the western, uh, the northern, and the southern districts of of uh, and in each state has a, a varying amount of of U.S. attorneys there, depending on the size of the state and what kind of industry. Right. Depending on how many district but, courts they have. Um. So, but so. Is, does white collar crime, because then I want to ask, like, you know, what sort of the, the, the costs are and now that we don't, now that we've established that we, we don't really have a solid definition of it, but I want to get an assessment of it. But before we move on to that, does it work as a mechanism in which to essentially signify we just don't take this as seriously? I mean, is it, is it, or at the very least that it's like, you know, I'm, we're qualifying what kind of crime it is. Like we could just call it, crime <laughs> right and, well, and yeah well see we could but the whole apparatus is um the whole mindset is not that and just i told you the evolution of the word but i don't know if you know this it, and i don't think you went to law school but maybe one day you will i did i did, I did for oh. anyways yes okay do you remember crim law i certainly do well uh i think we had uh I think I did have criminal law. Yes. First year. Yes. Okay. It was all, you know, it was all violent crimes and rape 
and that kind of thing. There was no white collar crime. It's not taught in the first year of criminal class. It's usually state by 